ladies and gentlemen, this is uh, Dr. Frank Chase back with you one more time. Uh, yes, I have been sharing a lot of tithing videos over the years. And um, in this particular video, I want to just uh, share some excerpts. I call them book bubbles and uh, give you some kind of background on why I wrote a particular paragraph or a chapter, or not like a read whole chapters, but why I wrote a particular excerpt and give you some insight. And um, I hope some of this information about the book gets you interested in studying this subject, because if you don't study tithing, um, you are missing out on a lot of good information that could save your financial future and basically your financial life. And I'm not just saying that for effect, but truly understanding the biblical tithe is most important in knowing where your money should be going and how you should give money. So I'm going to share a few excerpts in this particular session, in this particular video, and I'm not going to make these uh, pretty long. I'm going to probably share two excerpts, and they, these are quick, uh, quick uh, things you could just focus on and read in your leisure time and come back and study. One of the first ones I want to... Uh, to share with you uh, is, uh, and, uh, and this particular insight is, uh, hold on here, I got the, I'm doing this from my, uh, <laughs> from my computer, so I'm trying to read it to you and do the same thing. So in this particular one that I'm going to share, uh, uh, let's see, that's what I'm, I'm going through here, and let's see which one I'm going to share. Well, this first one here is, will a man rob God? So, um, and I know you hear that that particular sermon every Sunday. And uh, I want to read you an excerpt from my book considering that question, Will a Man Rob God? And then I'm going to share some author insight with you on this matter. And here we go. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you in tithes and offerings? You are cursed with a curse. For you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Pay attention to that. Food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open up the windows of heaven for you and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough for you to receive. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, so that you will not, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, and shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations will call you blessed, for you will be delightful, will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Uh, so let's continue to read on for some of this. It says, The thought that God promises abundant blessings and rewards for tithing money is hard not to believe, ladies and gentlemen. However, when you examine the scriptures, do tithes and offerings really translate to money? Can we apply tithing, crops, and cattle as it did in the Hebrew nations eons ago to tithing money today? If you are scared of Malachi's curse, you won't be after reading and understanding what follows in this chapter. Dismantling the argument for tithing using Malachi starts with proper interpretation principles. The belief that you must tithe on gross or net income is where the confusion begins. Depending on who is teaching the subject, some will say the tithe is on gross pay, and others say tithing is on net pay. Both are actually wrong. The second problem is that for hundreds of years since the 6th century, the early church and subsequent denominations have been unable to convince the majority of Christians throughout the ages that tithing money actually works as taught. The third problem with using Malachi to justify the net tithe argument or the gross tithe argument is that many people don't receive the abundant blessings they heard about. And that's a fact, ladies and gentlemen. 
since tithers remain poor their entire lives after tithing for years, while others seem to experience economic growth. That sounds like God is showing partiality. Let me make this perfectly clear. Understanding the tithe in Malachi cannot be done unless you read the entire book for context. Malachi must be read alongside Nehemiah because Nehemiah gives details about gives details that help explain Malachi. Both Malachi and Nehemiah lived during the same period and both were dealing with the issues of tithing in Israel. God is speaking to the Hebrew people of Israel. Oh, let me read that again. God is speaking to the Hebrew people of Israel, or is he speaking to you in Malachi? I'm sure you have heard many things or many tithing sermons that will blow your mind. Most of the money focused, most of the money focused interpretations sound so good, you can't help but walk away from the offering plate thinking, wow, God will turn this tenth I paid into so much money that I won't be able to contain it. What many unsuspecting believers don't realize is that most tithing sermons are compilations of various tithe teachings thrown together. Over time, this hodgepodge of tithe sermons become traditions of men. Today, most tithe sermons are elevated to the status of commandments of God and what you end up with is a hyper-spiritualized version of Malachi 3, 8 through 10. Roger Sapp in his book, The Christians Are Free Givers, are a perfect... Roger Sapp in his book, The Children Are Free, gives a perfect rendition of what most people hear in their spiritual ear when listening to tithe sermons. You might hear something like this spiritualized version from the pulpit. Bring, as an act of worship, the full amount of your tithe, 10% of your ongoing income into the storehouse, the local church, that there may be food, spiritual food, in my house, the local church. And prove me now, presently, by it, put me to test. Give me an opportunity to prove myself and you will see that I will open the windows of heaven to you and pour you out so much financial material blessing that you will not have room enough to contain it. Then I will rebuke, protect your income from the devourer, the devil, for you. I will stop the thief, the devil, from destroying the fruit, money, material good of your labors. This rendition sounds good and appeals to our material senses because we all need and want more money for many reasons. When you examine the spiritualized version of Malachi with an eye on proper exegesis and hermeneutics, you can see the spiritualized version is totally out of context. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to come right back and um, I'm going to share my author insight on this. And um, as you can see, uh, this excerpt from my book is powerful because that spiritualized version of Malachi is totally, totally non-scriptural. <laughs> gentlemen. Uh, I hope that book excerpt uh, helped you a lot in understanding uh, the question of will a man rob God. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to share some author insight with you on that excerpt from my book and give you a kind of taste of maybe why I wrote that particular uh, excerpt and give you some more insight into the excerpt. So here are my thoughts about will a man rob God. So I first start out by saying, to answer this question, 
and to put the suspense to rest, no believer today robs God of tithes and offerings unless they are farmers and ranchers in Israel under the covenant of the law. The words, will a man rob God, has an immense psychological impact in churches because many believe Malachi 3.10 requires 10% of their paycheck to be paid to God through the vehicle of the institutional church. Could you imagine my shock? And this is me, ladies and gentlemen, my shock when I discovered that monetary tithing is not the subject of Malachi chapter three. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, your paycheck is not a tithable commodity. In chapter 10 of my book, you will also discover that the storehouse the tithe was brought to is not a church, but a barn for storing crops and cattle. The words robbing God can have a lasting impact on how you handle your money. Many sermons address Malachi 3.10, and pastors will make it their primary goal to ensure you cough up 10%. To make sure you do not hold back, you'll be called a God robber, and the fear of that label drives many congregants to pay up. Almost sounds like a, a mafia boss, right? <laughs> but know this, your money is not a biblical authentic tithe. Paying 10% to the church resembles a temple tax or tax return giving. And that's my book bubble for today. And I'm gonna come back and share another one with you in just a moment, but this one is ended for now. So chew on that for a moment and consider it. Will a man rob God? We'll be right back in a new video. Thanks. For Ladies and gentlemen, it's Frank Chase back with you again. Oh boy, these little short tithing uh, excerpts that I'm going to share with you, hopefully they are insightful and you learn something from them. And uh, this next one I want to share is probably a lot of questions are going on around the biblical understanding of Paul. And I'm specifically talking about did Paul work full time in the ministry? That is the quintessential question. Uh, in this book bubble that I'm about to share, I'm going to share a little insight, and then I'm going to give you my author insight, and I'm going to share the book excerpt. And we're going to find out something about Paul, because there are a lot of preachers and a lot of pastors who call themselves full time. And uh, if you know a little bit about the Jewish history and the background of of the Hebrew people, one should question whether or not they were preaching itinerant preachers running around Jerusalem preaching for money. So uh, we're going to get into Paul's work history and work, work background. And in fact, in my book, Kleptomaniac, Who's Really Robbing God Anyway, I spend a lot of ink talking about Paul and what his work background is. And so we're going to share the excerpt here, and let me get right to it. Uh, the book excerpt uh, from my book reads, Before addressing Paul's writings, keep in mind that Paul never wrote a word about tithing in his epistles, nor did he require <clears throat> any church to pay him a tithe. That's because the food tithe still went to the temple Levites and priests. Paul was not a Levite, so he had no authority 
to collect tithes from the ecclesia. To do so, he would have been stealing the Levites' inheritance, which belonged to them as long as the temple stood. This fact is established throughout this book, in reference to my book. Now we have to ask whether Paul taught on the issue of support for gospel workers. We have to obtain a clear picture of Paul's cultural background as a Hebrew of Hebrews. This is important to help set up the context of what he believed about work and receiving support as an apostle. According to Jewish thought concerning the law, interpretations of the law unsuitable for everyday life should be avoided. Since this is the case, changing the biblical food tithe, which is Hebrew in Hebrew, ma'asar, from herds, flocks, and crops to money, and I said money in the Hebrew or the tithe of money would have to appear in the scripture as mesa kasafim, is not suitable for the modern monetary economy because it creates an entitlement aristocracy among pastors and preachers in the ministry. Based on Paul's background and from the ages of antiquity in Jewish thought, it has always been thought that a Jewish son who is taught Torah, which is not combined with teaching of a skill with the hands, leads finally to laziness and sin. Thus, inactivity gives way to evil impulse and leads to a fall. A profession meant studying the things of heaven and practical life. He who does not teach his son a profession makes him a good for nothing. Can you hear that? Can you read that? Did you just hear what I just said? If you are not doing reasonable work, and if you don't teach your children, your son, to do work, a real job, and not just preaching alone, he's a good for nothing. My God. In other, in other places, it is said that a Jewish man who does not teach his son a trade teaches him to become a thief. Jewish boys were all compelled to learn trades to support themselves. Let me repeat that. Jewish boys were all compelled to learn trades to support themselves. If you study Jewish culture, there are many examples that show it was considered disreputable if a man did not have a secondary skill outside of teaching scripture. It was also important to have practical knowledge of a trade which was necessary and regarded as a requisite to personal independence. Today, many pastors would starve to death because they lack professional skills with which to make a living. This makes them 100% codependent on others for every aspect of life. Paul would frown on this behavior today. And I know that hits hard, and I know that's probably shocking to many people. But we're going to come back, and I'm going to share my author insight about this particular excerpt from the book. Ladies and gentlemen, you got to go to work. We'll be right back. and gentlemen, we are back. I hope you just heard what I said in the previous segment about Paul and full-time ministry. Um, I was just plainly shocked. And before I read my author insight of the excerpt I just read, I want to give you this tidbit because it's not in my author insight. When I was studying for this uh, uh, book and trying to write this tithing book, it was clear to me from the research that Paul was a carpenter and everybody knows that he was a, a, a tent maker. I'm sorry, I meant to say tent maker. And I did a little history research on the tent making business and it was very lucrative. Uh, it was not a fly by night job and it was extremely lucrative. So Paul was not hurting for anything. Now, let me make this perfectly clear also is that he did receive support, voluntary support, but it was never mandatory that any of the people that he ministered to provide him support. He said he, he had a right to it, 
And the scripture is saying that because he was sharing things with them, but he never collected tithes. And in many cases, he refused it because he didn't want the gospel to be affected by that fact. So he said he would rather uh, not receive anything, but he never made it uh, a mandatory that they provide support. But because people uh, really loved Paul and they support, they supported him. So uh, if you study his life, you're going to find many things uh, about work and ministry that is just simply not practiced today. So let's get into my, um, let's get into here, my author insight about my excerpt. Okay, let me begin here. This excerpt from the book explores Apostles Paul's life as a man who worked and ministered God's word in the synagogues. In my studies of his life and Hebrew background, I was shocked to discover that Paul would have never asked anyone in the congregations where he ministered for any full-time support or salary. It is clear from his culture and background that seeking a salary for preaching was something Hebrews did not practice. Although Paul had a right of support, which he makes clear in the scripture, he never asked believers to pay him a salary or to tithe. In fact, the scripture says he often refused support and chose work instead. It is unclear to me why so many so-called pastors and preachers are unwilling to follow Paul's ministry example and work. Paul was what you might call a bivocational preacher. Yes, and let me stop here. He was a bivocational minister, a bivocational preacher. And that's what the scripture teaches, having two vocations, full-time job and ministry. Since the temple stood during Paul's time, there is no way he could have accepted tithes because that would have constituted robbery of the Levites. Paul was never a full-time pastor or preacher, as it were, because he worked in the tent making business. And from historical analysis of his work ethic, Paul worked as an entrepreneur for more than 50 years. That means full-time ministry is a man-made invention. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, as I continue to read these book bubbles and excerpts from my book, I hope you take the time to dig in and research and let me know what you think about them. And then try to go out to my blog and read more information at tithenomore.com. And so we'll leave you with this. If you're a preacher, you got to go to work. We'll see you next time.